Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Meeting House of Provincetown, where we affirm the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and where we support each other on our spiritual search for truth and meaning. My name is Reverend Kate Wilkinson, and I am so glad that you are here this morning. Welcome to those of you in the room, and welcome also to those of you joining us via our live stream. Today is a great day for me because although I am here in the pulpit, I do not have to give the sermon. Instead, I get to be your worship host today. That sometimes happens when there are five Sundays in a month. I really only have three sermons in me a month, folks. <laughs> so we are so blessed this morning to hear a message from Claire Willis. Claire, oh yes, they want to clap before you even started. They're a great crew to preach to, Claire. Claire is an oncology social worker who works with people living with cancer, those who are grieving, and people who are approaching the end of life. She has written two books, one on grief and one on preparing for the end of life. And she is also a member of our worship committee here at the UU Meeting House of Provincetown. So thank you so much for sharing your message with us this morning, Claire. Before we go on with our service, I have just a few announcements to share with you. First, I really want to thank Ada for filling in this morning, directing our choir. Thank you so much. And also our prayers go out to Mary and Ave. They did have a death in their family, so let's keep them on our hearts. I can't believe this, but next weekend is Easter already. So we hope that you can join us for Easter Sunday here at the Meeting House. We'll have a family-friendly worship service followed by an Easter egg hunt out on our lawn. If you haven't been around here, you should know that it is our tradition that people of all ages and genders wear Easter bonnets on Easter Sunday. So we invite you to join us in that tradition. Homemade is even better than store-bought hats, so start working on those bonnets. If you're doing any baking or shopping this week, maybe you'll want to bring some treats for coffee hour next weekend to make it a little special for the holiday. And you can help the Easter Bunny to prepare for that egg hunt by dropping off individually wrapped candy or tiny egg-sized toys over the next few days. And if you'd like to help fill the eggs, we're doing that on Thursday at 2 o'clock. Our last Soul Collage card workshop is tomorrow at 2.30 downstairs in Acker Bosworth Hall. This is the last event of our Winter Spirituality Series. So thank you all so much for making the whole series such a success this winter. And particularly, thanks to our fabulous worship committee for organizing all of the offerings. We have word that the scaffolding begins to go up tomorrow for our steeple painting project. So we expect this project to take about a month if all goes well and if it would ever stop raining. We ask you to take access would be safe under scaffolding, even over there, we'll let you know. And finally, if you are here in person today, we hope that you will stick around for a little while after the service ends for coffee and conversation downstairs in Acker Bosworth Hall. Now let's take a moment to affirm our community's covenant. You can find this on the little purple laminated cards in your pews, or you can just listen line by line as I say it. I invite you to repeat each line after me. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. Love is the spirit of this meeting house. This is our great covenant. This is our great covenant. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. 
And now as we light our chalice here in the sanctuary, I invite those of you who are watching from home to light a candle wherever you are. In that way, we can feel connected even while we are apart. This morning, I invite Tina to light our chalice for us as I read these words by Albert Schweitzer. At times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. And now I invite you to join me in singing our opening hymn. It's number four, I Brought My Spirit to the Sea. That's number four in these gray hymnals. I Brought My Spirit to the Sea. Please rise as you are able. My name is Claire Willis, and I'm working with Kate today. I have the harder part of the service. <laughs> so I would like to invite you now into a time of meditation and prayer. During this time, or at any time during the service, you are welcome to light a silent candle at the table to the right of the pulpit, where there is a journal to record your thoughts and prayers. After our prayer, we will sing together Spirit of Life, hymn number 123, which is also printed on the purple laminated cards in your pews. We'll sing first in English, and then we'll sing in Spanish. This morning's prayer is called Prayer for What is Broken, and it was written by my friend and colleague, a UU minister, a UCC minister, named Brita Gill Austern. I'm broken only if broken means I live another day, my heart holding me. We are broken only if broken means we are human guests on this planet, needing one another to live and love. Broken we live, our scars a prayer for our suffering. I see you through the cracks, sunlight dapples your eyes. Stars visit from fallen heaven. Let each scar shine our path forward. Let each scar fill our heavens with light. Sunlight, starlight, scarlight, broken yet whole.
So Claire and I are both in love with this poet, James Cruz. And he wrote both of the poems that we'll be sharing for our readings this morning, although we're not sure how much time passed between writing the first and writing the second. The first is called Kintsugi. Anyone who loves someone else already has a broken heart. It's the law. If you want that light to flood your body, you must expose the cracks through which it pours, since they are the source of your beauty and your strength. Think of the Japanese who fill the cracks in a ceramic bowl with pure gold, not only flaunting those so-called flaws, but also making each one a priceless vein through which light now moves. I invite you to join me in singing our next hymn, number six, Just As Long As I Have Breath. That's number six in the same gray hymnal, Just As Long As I Have Breath. Please rise as you are able. Kintsugi Again by James Cruz. In the Japanese art of mending ceramics with powdered gold, no one ever talks about how they'd leave the pots, cups, and cracked bowls broken for a while, sometimes whole generations. And so I say to you, let your heart stay shattered in your chest. Let it ache. Some may claim you've now been broken open and can let in the light. This might be true. But before you rush to gloss over the wounds, filling the holes with gold so they glimmer, try to find beauty in the broken places, too. Proof of where the fire left its mark on you. Now is the time in our service where we take a collection for the ongoing support of this meeting house and our shared ministry. As we enjoy a musical reflection by our choir, we welcome your donations here in the sanctuary or online through PayPal or Venmo. You can find that information on our website, uumh.org. 
and there are QR code cards in the pews as well. I invite two volunteer ushers to come forward to take the collection. On and off site, your offerings will now be gratefully received. reflection this morning is called Strong in the Broken Places. And I'm going to start with some words by Ernest Hemingway from A Farewell to Arms. The world breaks everyone, and afterward many are strong at the broken places. I'd like you to consider today these beautiful, perhaps familiar words that Ernest Hemingway wrote in A Farewell to Arms. The world breaks everyone, and afterward, many are strong at the broken places. Strong at the broken places. That's today's theme and what I would invite us to reflect on together this morning. Recently, I read an article about a Japanese practice called kintsugi. This is a kintsugi bowl that was cracked and then filled in with the gold, and I'll have it out after, this, after the reflection. 
Kintsugi is the century-old art form, a Japanese form and method and process of repairing broken porcelain bowls. It's a long-standing tradition that highlights imperfections rather than hiding them. In this practice of kintsugi, pottery bowls that have been broken are repaired through the application of a liquid gold, commonly called golden joinery. The lacquer is extracted from the sap of an indigenous tree in Japan. The lacquer is very precious because the tree will be cut down after a cup of the sap is extracted from it. The sap is like the blood of the tree. So this extraction actually ends the life of the tree. As a result, the Japanese people are always very grateful for the repair of the bowl and grateful to the tree for, and nature for providing it. This process of restoration can take up to three months. The lacquer must dry and harden before it can be dusted with the finishing touch of gold. The powdered gold highlights the fracture and is essential to the process of restoring broken things. It becomes an important part of the history of the object. Instead of covering up the flaws, Kintsugi beautifies the breakage. The lacquered cracks are covered with gold to transform the pot into a sacred object. So then the pot restored becomes a symbol of fragility, of resilience, strength, and beauty. Once completed, the beautiful seams of gold glint in, in the cracks of ceramic wares, giving it a one-of-a-kind appearance. Sometimes even the gold cracks are often referred to as precious scars, and they become even more beautiful than the original piece. A fundamental philosophy behind Kintsugi is that all things are created and destined to be broken, but nothing is truly ever broken. It's never considered a bad thing, but it's just simply a way of life. Naya Lizardo, a blog writer, wrote, Kintsugi artisans do not hide the fractures, fractures in a broken pottery piece. They illuminate them filling the fish, fissures with precious metals like gold or silver. Instead of disguising the damage, they honor it. They celebrate it, turning the cracked piece into a masterpiece, even more beautiful and precious than it was before the breakage. So imagine looking at our own scars, looking at them as precious scars, <clears throat> both visible and invisible not as blemishes, not as a testament to our strength, I'm sorry, not as blemishes, but as a testament to our strength, our resilience, and our capacity to mend. Imagine viewing our past not as a series of misfortunes that diminished our worth, but as episodes of life that fortify our identity. Seeing the golden seams of our healing not as sources of shame, but as signs of our strength and symbols of our resilience. Kintsugi resonated deeply with me, both personally and professionally. <clears throat> For several years, I have worked with people who are carrying wounds and sorrows, the loss of someone they loved, the loss of their health, their identity, their home, their pet, parts of themselves, of land, of political safety or their job, or the, life of law, the loss of life as they had known it. Many of us may even be anticipating a loss that has not yet occurred, but we are grieving in advance, <clears throat> as if to prepare for what we perceive as inevitable that will break us open. Too many of us carry our sorrows hidden, our wounds underground, barricaded by shame and judgment. Recently, I asked some folks with whom I work to reflect on how they had changed following various traumatic and abrupt life changes. I asked them, where have you grown stronger? Where has an unexpected gift emerged? 
what relationships develop that might, under different circumstances, not have. One woman shared that she grew up with a developmentally delayed younger brother. As a child, she had been furious at her brother for requiring all the attention from her parents. She felt ignored and lonely most of her life. As an adult, she became a special needs teacher. She excelled to such an extent that she became the primary consultant to an entire special needs program in a major urban eastern city. She told us her success was a result of what she had learned early on in her family. As an adult, she understood how to be with and teach younger children who had special needs. Her wound became her gift, a thing of beauty. She worked with her precious scar. A man in my cancer group felt unloved as an only child. He had no siblings with whom he could turn. Both parents traveled and he was often alone with a hired caregiver. His primary source of solace was in the natural world. He would take long walks after school in the woods before he went home to an empty house. He talked to the trees and plants in the woods. He made terrariums, terrariums from the ground covers in the forest. He built an imaginary home for himself with branches, canvas, leaves, and ties where he went each day after school. Today, he's an active environmentalist advocating for conservation. He has become a strong voice for the voiceless. His wound became a gift because he worked with his precious scar. A colleague of mine lost her husband in 9-11. She had spoken to him the night before her died and shared with him she had just learned she was pregnant. The next morning, her husband died as he was a passenger on one of the planes that hit the World Trade Center. A few years later, she opened up a center, <clears throat> a center for grief, where she has a staff of about 15 therapists whose specialty is bereavement counseling. Her wound became her gift because she worked with her precious scar. Most recently, I have a friend I have known for 25 years who was recently diagnosed with metastatic cancer. We were not intimate friends, but we were good friends. He was generous with his time, often helping me with any job I needed around my house. He loved my dog, and when I would say, let's go see Rob, my dog would tear out of the house down the street and sit at Rob's door and whine until he let her in. He was not one to wear his heart on his sleeve. He didn't ever speak about his feelings. He never asked me a question about my life. Following his diagnosis, I had him over for dinner. We chit-chatted, which is a word he often used, and when he got up to leave, he said to me, ever since I've had radiation, I've been crying. I don't know why, because I don't feel sad but I feel as though I love everyone so much. Then he said to me, I love you, Claire. And he started to weep. In that moment, he was utterly magnificent to me, so open, so loving, and so beautiful. And he was so broken open, physically and emotionally. It's hard for me to talk about this because it's so current. To say I was moved by this, does not speak to the depth of my feelings. When I met with my Buddhist teacher, following this conversation, I asked him, why do we have to have death on the horizon to love so fully, so openly, so unconditionally and unencumberedly? To which he responded, looking at what obscures us from loving is our deepest practice. We can all find strength and hope in our broken places, our precious scars. If you have been living with grief for a while and glimpse the fog of grief lifting, consider what unexpected strengths or gifts have emerged from your loss. If you are on the other side of a health crisis, what did you discover about your resilience, your strength that has been tested in ways you were, that were new to you where have you been broken open? 
and where has your heart been expanded? What are your precious scars? Rilke <clears throat> says in his poem, let the darkness be a bell tower. Let this darkness be a bell tower and you the bell. As you ring, what batters you becomes your strength. In the coming days, consider what resilience has emerged in you because of your precious scars. What relationships develop that you could not have anticipated? Where has your battering become your strength? I want to close with a poem called The Healing Time by Pesha Joyce Gertler. Finally, on my way to yes, I bump into all the places where I said no to my life. All the untended wounds, the red and purple scars, those hieroglyphs of pain carved into my skin, my bones, those coded messages that send me down the wrong street again and again where I find them, the old wounds, the old misdirections, and I lift them one by one, and I say, holy, holy, blessed be. Thank you so much, Claire. It has become our practice to pose a question based on the theme of the service each week can be a topic of sharing at coffee hour today or with friends during the week. If you'd like to delve deeper into this question, we invite you to join us at our Zoom coffee hour on Tuesday evening at five o'clock. Please contact the office if you need that link. Our question this week is, where have you found strength in your broken places? Where have you surprised yourself and seen beauty and wholeness in what was wounded or broken? I'll say that again. Where have you found strength in your broken places? Where have you surprised yourself and seen beauty and wholeness in what was wounded or broken? So in closing, <clears throat> may we find holiness, strength, and beauty in our broken places. May we bring tenderness to ourselves. May we know that we are whole just as we are. Amen. Amen.